Okay. Um, so, uh, let's see a show of hands of, of recognition. How many people have heard the words Mandelbrot set? Can you? Okay, that's good. How about raising your virtual hand? <laughs> Just to see if we can. That gives me a count. Great. Um, so I see one thumbs up, eight hands. <laughs> so the majority of people have. Um, nevertheless, uh, maybe not everyone knows the details behind Mandelbrot sets and Julia sets. They're actually a very beautiful example in complex analysis closely related to many of the things we're going to discuss in this course and uh, where many things that seem rather abstract, Riemann mappings, green functions, and so on can be made very explicit. Uh, so let me give you a very brief um, introduction to the kind of thing one studies. So we let P of Z, Z to the D plus A1, Z to the D minus one, plus AD. This is a the harmonic polynomial of degree D greater than one. And uh, what we're interested in studying are the orbits of points. So we take a, a point Z naught and we send it to Z1, which is P of Z. And then we send it to Z2, which is P of Z1 and so on. So this orbit, Z naught, Z1, Z2, is what you get by iterating the polynomial. You apply the map P and you apply it again and so on. And a typical question is what's the long-term behavior of this orbit? Now, it, it turns out that when Z is large, the behavior of the polynomial is dominated by this term. And if you take a large number and raise it to a power bigger than one, like if you square it, it gets much larger. And so when all the points that are large enough in the complex plane just go off to infinity when you iterate. The interesting th behavior occurs in what's called the Phil Julia set of this polynomial. This is the set of Z such that the orbit stays bounded. It does not go off to infinity. Now it's easy to show that the complement of the Julia set in the complex plane, this is of course the set of Z such that P to the N of Z tends to infinity. This doesn't mean you take the nth power, this means you take P and you compose itself and with itself n times and apply it to Z. It's easy to see that this is, an, this is open and it's connected. And, and that its complement is bounded, or in other words, it contains a neighborhood of infinity. And so this K of P is compact. Now, how do you know K of P isn't just the empty set? Well, if you solve the polynomial P to the N of Z is equal to Z, this is a polynomial of degree D to the N. Z, Z to the D to the N plus dot 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 equals Z. This has D to the N solutions counted with multiplicity. Those are periodic points. They're points that come back to themselves after N iterates. So that when N is five, when N is four, you get points that cycle like this. And of course, those points do have bounded orbits. And uh, therefore, this set K of P is, is uh, actually quite large and fairly complicated. Um, uh, and in particular, it's compact. Now, there's another reason why a point might lie in K of P. In fact, why a whole open set might lie in K of P. You might have a point that comes back to itself, and then there's a small neighborhood of this point, which under iteration comes back and then goes strictly inside of itself. So if there's this neighborhood U, and under say P to the fourth, it goes into U again. And in fact, it goes strictly inside of U, goes to a proper subset. Then by the Schwartz lemma, 
this first return map is a contraction. And in fact, every point in this ball U converges to the center under iteration. And moreover, at this central point, let me call it P, the derivative of the fourth iterate is an absolute value less than one. So this is what's called an attracting cycle. And once you have an attracting cycle, you get a whole open set inside of the Julia set. It's like a little whirlpool and it sex points into it. And, um, and so your picture of K of P might be that it somehow looks, it's this complicated set. It doesn't have to be connected, but let's pretend it is. And, um, and then it, it maybe has some, some open subsets where, um, where there's a periodic cycle. Now these periodic cycles might have very large order. So they might be hard to find. And also you might wonder, could there be very many of these pieces of fruit inside of your Phil Julia set? corresponding to different periods. Maybe there's infinitely many attracting cycles. Well, there's not, and this is a basic theorem proved by Fatou and Julia in the 1920s. Beautiful starting point for the whole theory, and it, this theorem is that every attracting cycle attracts a critical point. What does a critical point mean? It just means a point Z where P prime of Z is equal to zero, a branch point of the map. Now the number of zeros of P prime is of course at most D minus one. So as a corollary, you can't have infinitely many attracting cycles, the number of attracting cycles is less than or equal to B minus one. The Mandelbrot set concerns the study of the first uh, interesting case, which is the case where D is equal to two. When D is equal to two, you can have at most one attracting cycle. And this attracting cycle might have enormous period. It might be period a thousand. Um, and so you you can't find it in any reasonable way by, say, looking at all the periodic points of period 1,000, because there's roughly two to the 1,000 such periodic points. The way to find the attractor of a polynomial is to take the critical points and iterate them and see if they converge to attracting cycles. And in the case of the very simple case where P of Z is Z squared plus C, there's only one critical point which is if C is equal to zero. So if you want to determine if this polynomial has an attractor, you just iterate zero. And if it has one, it will converge to it. By the way, if a corollary of this also is that if zero is not in the Phil Julia set, this implies there's no attractor. There's no attracting cycle. And the Mandelbrot set is uh, the compact subset consisting of the values of C, where zero is in the, um, in the Phil Julia set. So to draw that set, you just iterate this polynomial starting with zero and see whether or not zero goes off to infinity. Okay, so let me conclude this with just a little example. Some of, of the type some of you may have seen before. So this white region is the Phil Julia set of a quadratic polynomial. And this quadratic polynomial's critical point is right here. It's right at the center of the picture, as you would expect by symmetry. And uh, the image of the critical point is here. And then it goes to here and here and here. And then it comes back to where it started. So in this example, the critical point is actually periodic of period five, and everything that's in the white region here eventually lands in this central area, central white component near the critical point, and then it's attracted to the critical point under iteration. So the white region 
uh, has well-defined de dynamics, everything converges to this attractor, which just consists of five points. And everything outside of the white region goes off to infinity. And there's a, I've drawn a level set of a function you can compute that measures the rate at which it comes goes off to infinity. We'll revisit this function when we study potential theory. It's called the Green's function. And finally, there's this fractal set of points which don't know if they want to go to infinity or go to the attractor. So they don't do either. And that's what's called the Julia set. It's the boundary of K of P. It's the boundary of the filled Julia set. OK, so just to wrap this up, let me indicate why whenever you have an attractor, it has to attract a critical point. The reason for that is fairly easy. Um, So just for simplicity, let's pretend you have an attracting fixed point. Because after all, if you have an, a periodic point for P and the period is N, then if you replace P by P to the N, it becomes an attracting fixed point. So suppose P is an attracting fixed point for our polynomial P. So we have our Phil Julia set. It might be very complicated, but what we know is that there's a point P and everything in a certain disk U is attracted to P under iteration. So to be precise, we let U be the component of the interior of K of P containing P. So here's our open set U. And now our mapping F sends U to itself. In fact, it also sends the boundary of U to itself. Therefore, it's a proper map when it's restricted to U. And finally, U is a disk because of the fact that the basin of infinity is connected. So anything that's left over is simply connected. It can't have any holes in it. So U is topologically a disk. And what that means is we can apply the Riemann mapping theorem to send U to the unit disk and to send this attracting point P to zero and to send our proper map F to some proper map F of the unit disk to itself. But now we're done. You see, we can apply the Schwartz lemma. And the Schwartz lemma says that uh, either this mapping F is, um, is a, a rotation or it's a contraction. Now, of course, F is not a rotation because of the fact that the point P is attracting. Sorry, this should be what we call my Riemann mapping phi. This is the origin here. P is sense of the origin. So the map over here has to be a contraction. But if the map F has no critical points, the map capital F has no critical points, then it's a local homeomorphism. But it's also proper that is, it sends the boundary of the disk to itself. And a proper local homeomorphism is a covering map. And a covering map of the disk to itself must be an automorphism. That is, it's a homeomorphism and conformal. But we know that the only automorphisms fixing the origin are rotations. And that's ruled out. Another way to say the proof is that after we've conjugated over, F is a proper map of the disk to itself of some degree D prime, less than or equal to D. And that if D prime is equal to one, then F is a rotation. And in general, F of Z is given by a Blaster product of degree D prime. We 
can be very precise here. These are the proper maps on the disk of degree D prime. It's a rational map of degree D prime. And if D prime is bigger than one, then this mapping has a critical point somewhere inside the disk, as you can easily verify by differentiation. Okay, so that's this is the theorem that really gets complex dynamics on its feet. It's that um, the attractors can always be located by looking at critical points. And as I say, we'll revisit this example from other perspectives as we pursue other conformal invariants. Okay, so the next topic I'd like to address is the boundary behavior of, con of conformal maps, of Riemann mappings. And I think I personally feel much more secure when I know that my Riemann mapping is well behaved on the boundary. Um, so what can we say about the boundary behavior of a conformal isomorphism that is F from the unit disk to a domain U contained in C, where this is analytic and it's one-to-one -one and on two. And um, just for simplicity, I'm going to pretend that U is bounded, but it might be pretty wild. It might have some of these strange non-locally connected behaviors going on, et cetera. Um, just to give you a concrete picture in mind. Um, uh, so the first thing that we can assert, which doesn't have anything to do with the nature of this target domain U, is that the radial limits exist in almost every Z and S one. So this is quite remarkable because you see by making the boundary kind of wild, you can make sure that there's some places where the image of a ray here, that is we draw a ray in the unit disk, it might be forced to do something really weird here. So if we have these two interleaving fans, the image of this ray might have to wind back and forth as in an example I did last time, and not converge at all. But the claim is that if you pick a point at random on the circle, then the image of this line will always converge to a well-defined point in the boundary of U. So we can actually talk about the values of any Riemann mapping on the circle as long as we're willing to throw out a set of measure zero. And by what I mean by this radial limit is if we're given a point on the circle, then the radial limit, which is what we would like to take for the value of f of z, is the limit as r goes to 1 from below of f of r times z. In other words, it's just the limit of the image of this sequence of points converging to the point on the boundary of z. And the claim is that this limit exists for almost every point in the circle. Okay, now one can soup up this argument to prove some stronger theorems, which are also very natural. And what they say is that the boundary values are as well behaved as they can possibly be. This says the boundary values, no matter how bad the domain is, they exist as often as you like, at least on a set of full measure. The second statement is if the boundary of U is a Jordan curve, then in fact, F extends to a homeomorphism, sending the circle to the boundary of U. So if the boundary of U is isomorphic to S1, one usually says then that U is a Jordan domain. This implies F extends to a map from the closed disk to the closure of U, and this map is a homeomorphism. In particular, the circle is then naturally parameterizes the boundary of U. Now there's some intermediate cases where the boundary of U 
might not be homeomorphic to a circle. So for example, maybe U looks like this. This uh, boundary is obviously not a circle, but you could still expect that as you, as you fall, go around the circle, that the map F traces out this boundary, it just doesn't do it in a one-to-one -one fashion. And for that to happen, it turns out this boundary has to have a topological property called local connectivity. And so the third theorem is that if U bar is locally, sorry, if the boundary of U is locally connected, if and only if F restricted to S1 is continuous. That's, I'm saying somewhat informally that the Riemann mapping has boundary values if and only if the boundary of U is relatively T, it's what's called locally connected. Locally connected means there exists a basis for the topology on this compact set consisting of connected sets. Uh, when we have an example, like I drew last time, that somehow is pathological like this, if we were to take a point here on the boundary of U, and try to take a small neighborhood of it, no matter how small we take the neighborhood, it would contain some of these spines, which are not connected to P. And so there is no connected open set containing P. That's an example of a set that's not locally connected. As long as that doesn't happen, the Riemann mapping is continuous. So taken all together, what these theorems show is that the Riemann mapping is as well behaved as it could possibly be. That's an illustration of the fact that it somehow is like a harmonic mapping. It's trying to, uh, to minimize its topological complexity, given that it's going to have to produce a map between these two regions. OK, so let me start out with the proof that radial limits exist. And this, this statement is one of the is going to illustrate one of the main techniques in the study of conformal mappings. So if you understand how we prove this, the magical way we prove that radial limits exist, you'll understand a lot about the way people study Riemann mappings. Because there are many theorems in math, but there's not that many proofs. You use the same type of argument over and over again, in fact, to prove all three of these theorems. The basic idea, it's what's called the length area method. Okay, so let me show you how that idea works in the proof of one. What we are going to study is the integral over the unit disk of the absolute value of the Riemann mapping. I'm going to integrate this with respect to area. And I want to try to control this integral. Now, there's one inequality which every analyst longs to use whenever they see an integral. <laughs> what is this basic inequality? You can apply whenever possible to see what happens. It comes right after the triangle inequality in terms of its utility. Cauchy Schwartz? The Cauchy Schwartz inequality. Absolutely. Thank you. So the Cauchy Schwartz inequality says the integral of f times g in absolute value is, let's square this, is less than or equal to the integral of f squared times the integral of g squared. That's at least for real valued functions. Um, so we long to use the cauchy schwartz inequality here, but we only have one function. We don't seem to have an f times g. Second main trick, you always have a second function. Use one. Okay, now let's hit this with cauchy schwartz You ready? So we take this and square it, and then what we get is less than or equal to the integral of f prime squared over the disk 
times the integral of 1 over the disk. Now that's not, both of these terms have a meaning. What's the integral of f prime squared? f prime squared is just the Jacobian derivative of f. So this is telling us what the area is of the image of the disk. And our disk is being sent to this bounded region u. So this quantity here is just the area of u. And similarly, this quantity here is just the area of the disk. So both those quantities are finite. And therefore, this quantity is also finite. Now, just from the finiteness of this quantity, we're going to be able to deduce that the radial limits exist almost everywhere. Why is that? Well, let's write this as the integral from 0 to 2 pi times the integral from 0 to 1 of, I'll just call it f prime of r beta. Of course, understanding that what that really means is z is r e to the i theta. I'm just doing it in polar coordinates. And then the area is, um, is r dr d theta. OK, now let's imagine that we fix theta. What does this quantity here represent? Well, if it weren't for this r, let's pretend the r is not there for the moment. This is the integral of f prime along a radius. What does that tell us? Well, if this is the value of theta here, and if the image of this radius is this arc gamma theta here, when you integrate f prime along this arc, you just get the length of this arc, right? This image arc is parameterized by this one and f prime tells you the speed of the parameterization. Now it happens that there's an r in here. Well let's let's use inequalities rather than equalities. So this is certainly greater than or equal to, to what we get if we integrated from a half to one and as we're going, r is increasing from a half to one. So if we replace this by a half, then we definitely still have the same inequality. And now this is literally the length of this arc, but not the arc starting at radius zero at the point zero, but the arc starting at radius a half. So it's the last part of the arc here. It's the part from some finite point on to the end. So let me call that L theta. It's the length of the image of this end half of the radius under F. So what is this theorem telling us? It's telling us that one half, the integral from zero to two pi of L theta D theta is less than or equal to something, which we can control very nicely. Well, if you integrate something and you get a finite number, the integrand must be finite almost everywhere. So as a corollary, what we find is that L theta is a finite number for almost every theta. In principle, there could be a few exceptional theta of measure zero where the length is infinite, but for almost every theta, the length is finite. But what can we say then about the length of gamma theta? Well, certainly the part from here to here that is the image of the compact piece from radius zero to a half, that certainly has finite length. And this is telling us the rest has finite length. So as a corollary, the length of the image of f of e to the i theta times zero one, in other words, the length of what I'm calling gamma theta is finite. Well, if you have an arc of finite length, it has to converge to a limit. And so as you move along this arc here, as the parameter r goes to 1, the image of f necessarily converges. That says exactly that the radial limit exists. So since the length is finite, this implies the radial limit exists.
So here's the, let me recapitulate and emphasize why this is called the length area inequality. First, the key is always to use the Cauchy-Schwartz inequality. And using Cauchy-Schwartz, we have area on one side, which is easy to control. And we, and we have a controlling length, which is on the other side and is generally harder to control. But conformal maps have the property that length and area are very closely bounded because F prime describes the distortion of both. And so the fact that the area of U is finite controls the length of every arc. And that's the essence of the length area method. Okay, so that's quite, quite amazing. And it also is a typical uh, example of how you prove that something holds almost everywhere without being able to specify where it fails. We just prove the integral of something is finite and then that something has to be finite almost everywhere. Okay, so now let's proceed to the case, the, the next theorem, which says that if we have a Jordan curve, if we have a Jordan domain, so the boundary of U is isomorphic to S1, then in fact, the mapping F is one to one. So this requires a slight, a slight souping up of the length area method. So let me, let me do another, let me say the length area method again in a slightly different way. Let's suppose we have a unit square, zero, one, I like this, and we have a mapping F one to one to some uh, region of V in the complex plane, F is conformal. Then by exactly the same argument, we get that the integral of F prime times one uh, squared is less than or equal to the area of S times the area of V. And since I've chosen this to be a unit square, I just get this is less than or equal to the area of V. Now, what is the integral of F prime squared? Well, you can think of this as you integrate first over horizontal lines, and then what you're computing are, is the length of the image of these horizontal lines. So for every value of y, we get a number ly, which is the length of gamma y, gamma y being the image of the horizontal arc of length one and height y. And that's exactly what this is. So since the height of this is one, this is the average value of ly squared. And it's bounded by the area of V. That's kind of like what you might expect. You start with a square, and if the area of this is not, is not too big, then most of the arcs that go from one side to the other are reasonably small. They're bounded explicitly by the square root of the area. Now we can also draw the lines in the vertical direction. And then we get arcs going like this. And what we find is that the average of LX squared is bounded by the area of V. Okay, now how do we apply that argument to our Jordan domain? Well, one thing we notice is that if you, if we, we can take you and inside of you, we can look at this narrow annulus, let me call it UR, and this is F of the disk minus the disk of radius R. So it's the image of this region here, if this radius is R. And uh, the intersections of the UR is empty. So the area of UR goes to zero. Now what that means is that if I draw a little square here, and now it's not gonna quite be a square, but let's not worry about it. That's just a small technical detail. If I draw a little square, between the radius r and the radius one, then the area of what it maps to, 
this will be my B, which is F of S of R. The area of, of what it maps to is also small. This is greater than or equal to the area of V. Oh, maybe I'll call it V sub R. That's what I'm so I can apply to this square here the same argument I applied here. Now you might object wait a second, this was supposed to be a unit square. But notice that the conclusion here has nothing to do with the domain of F. I have the area of the image and I have the lengths of these curves going across the image in either direction. So I could expand or contract the domain of F to any square of any size and the theorem would remain true. This square is, is uh, of course, slightly distorted, but still the same argument works. And what we find is that since the area of V of R is small, that the length of most of the arcs that you might draw horizontally, those arcs mostly have small length over here. And the length of most of the arcs that you might draw radially also have images that are not just a bounded length, but whose length is small. The length is controlled by the area of V of R, which is going to zero with R. So by taking a couple of these things here, so here I take, I go out until this area is very small, say this is uh, less than epsilon, and then this is greater than or equal to the average of what I might call LR squared, or the average of L theta squared. These being the arcs that I draw in the theta direction or in the R direction within this little slightly distorted square. So both of these lengths are less than or equal to the square root of epsilon on average. And so what that means is that I can find a point here and a point here and a point here such that these three arcs have small length. And these two points are separated by, let's say, R over two. And what I conclude is that the image of those arcs has total length less than or equal to three times the square root of epsilon. But you see, that means that not only does the value of F exist at this point and exist at this point, but that this whole region here is mapped into this region here. So that means whatever, if I take these points and call them say uh, P and Q, what I get is that the distance from F of P minus F of Q is less than or equal to three times the square root of epsilon. So I find that at least these two points have images that are close together on, this, on the boundary of U. But now I use the fact that U is a circle. Since U is topologically a circle, if you pick two points that are close enough together on U, then the part, the smaller part of the boundary that joins them together has length or diameter, which is controlled by the diameter of this arc. That's just like continuity. So the remainder is smaller than delta of epsilon. So what I've shown is that if I take are large enough, and then I cut the remainder of the circle into a bunch of squares, then the diameter of the image of any one of these squares is at most three times the square root of epsilon plus some additional delta of epsilon, everything going to zero as R goes to zero. So that proves that F sends sets of small measure near the boundary to sets of small, so small diameter near the boundary to sets of small diameter and therefore it extends continuously. Okay, so that's the sketch of the proof that at least when the image is a Jordan curve, the Jordan domain, the mapping F has a continuous extension to the boundary. Okay, now why is it one-to-one? -one? That's still something we have to prove. So let's clean up the picture. Start fresh. Now we have 
this beautiful fact that when our boundary is a Jordan curve, uh, our mapping extends continuously to the boundary. And the question is, could we have two points, P and Q, that map to the same point on our boundary? So here's the image of the origin. And uh, so could it happen that F of P is equal to F of Q? Why does that feel wrong to you and to me? Here's why. Let's draw the radius from P to Q from the origin. These two arcs will map to arcs that terminate at F of P and F of Q respectively. Now, what if those are the same point? We'll notice that the mapping of the interior to the interior is surjective, in fact, bijective. So the only place the boundary can go is to the boundary. So suppose I now take a ray which converges to a point between P and Q. Where is the corresponding radial limit going to be? After all, F has continuous boundary values. It has to send this arc somewhere to the boundary of U. Well, the only place that remains is this single point P here. So whatever this point is, let me call it um, Z naught, we would get that F of Z equals Z naught on the arc from P to Q contained in the unit circle. Now that should feel very bad to you. <laughs> you, have a, you have an analytic function and it's constant on an arc. For example, if this were zero, you would have an analytic function that is zero on a connected interval. What do we know about analytic functions and their zeros? The zeros are isolated. So if this were in the interior of the domain of F, that would force F to be a constant. In fact, the constant would have to be Z zero, which totally contradicts the fact that this is a Riemann mapping. The only problem is this is a function, this is the boundary values of the function. It's not in the interior. If it were in the interior, we would be done. But there's a very simple trick here. You see F is constant on this arc. And what that means is that by Schwartz reflection, F extends to an analytic function on the union of the disk and its image under reflection through this arc. So in fact, F extends by Schwartz reflection to a neighborhood an analytic function on the neighborhood of this arc because of the fact that F is constant here. And now you have an analytic function which is constant inside of its domain of definition, and therefore it is constant, which forces it to be constant in here inside the unit disk, which is a contradiction. So this explains why F is one, one to one. Okay. So just a word about what happens in the locally connected case. So that was two, that was the Jordan curve case. So to summarize, we have found that F of Z exists for almost every Z in S1. And two, F maps S1 isomorphically to the boundary of U when the boundary of U is itself a circle topologically. And then the third will be that F sends S1 continuously to the boundary of U when the boundary of U is locally connected. Okay, so the proof of three actually involves no new ideas in complex analysis at all, but it does involve a little additional topology of the plane. So let me try to explain what a locally connected set is. And the, the way to do that is to see what properties non-locally connected sets have that locally connected sets don't. So here again is my paradigmatic example 
of a non-locally connected set. And here's what's bad about it. Think of this region U as a lake. And now I want to create a small dam in this region. By a small dam, I mean the dam will be an arc whose length is, is finite. So it's a smooth arc. You could actually build it. It has some length that's small, epsilon. And then I look at the part of the lake that I've created now for swimming and sailing, partitioned off from the rest of the lake. And I see here in this example, a small dam makes a small lake. So that looks good. In fact, small dam makes small lake is equivalent to local connectivity. Oh, but this domain is not locally connected. So there are places you can make small dams where you make big lakes, by which I mean the diameter of the lake is big, even though the dam is very small. Who can give me an example of a place to build a dam, a short dam to make a big lake? Civil engineering is much easier than complex analysis. The bottom of the square, that is complicated. If you uh, disconnect a short part of it, it has a very long. Okay, so tell me where to draw my dam. Uh, from one of these horizontal line to the next one. Yeah, right. So if I put a line, a dam right here, for example, this dam is relatively short in fact, it's shorter than this one was, but the lake it cuts off is all of this stuff. It has large diameter. And I could take this segment and put it between bristles that are even closer to the bottom, and then the dam would be even shorter, but the lake would continue to have diameter roughly one. So this space this region, this lake, does not have the property that small dams give small lakes. Give small, <laughs> I guess I shouldn't call it. Small dam cuts off a small lake. Um, and that's in fact equivalent to the failure of local connectivity. Okay, so how do you prove that when your Riemann mapping goes to a locally connected region, that the map is continuous that was really the main point of our argument. What happened in our argument was that we, we made a square near the boundary and we found three arcs such that the image of these arcs in our domain U, which now might be kind of wild, who knows, but we got that the image of these three arcs gave us a sub arc of length bounded by three times the square root of epsilon joining two points P and Q in the boundary of U. And then what we wanted to conclude was that this whole square here mapped into a region of small diameter. And if the boundary of U were locally connected, we would have that because this is a small dam. And then the theorem is LC implies small dams create small lakes. So the diameter of the whole region would be bounded by the length of the dam plus some function of the length, which goes to zero as the length of the dam goes to zero. So that's what you need to prove local connectivity. I mean, to prove continuity. And it's exactly what co local connectivity provides. OK, so there's a pretty solid discussion of the boundary behavior of um, analytic maps. OK, so people have had lots of experience now with um, with analytic maps. So what I'd like to do is to break things up a little and send people to breakout rooms with a little problem. So the problem is one that, especially those of you who've done the homework are all very versed in, it's to construct a conformal map from a specified region to a standard region like the disk or the upper half plane. And so what I'd like you to do when I send you to breakout rooms is 
First, introduce yourself to each other. Second, pick a reporter for your region, for your region, for your, for your uh, breakout room, somebody to report on your results. And then third, discuss the following problem. So this problem is very simple. You can keep it in your head. The domain I'm interested in is the unit disk with the interval from zero to one cut out of it. So it's sort of a Pac-Man. You slit the unit disk by removing a radius. And your problem is to construct a conformal isomorphism, uh, it's a Riemann mapping, from this region to the standard disk. So the problem is to find f. And moreover, I'm not so interested in seeing the final formula for f. What I want to hear is a sequence of transformations that are easy to understand, g1 composed with g2 composed with g3, et cetera, which at the end of the day map my region u to the unit disk. So the actual formula is not important, but the idea is to apply a sequence of elementary transformations until you're able to turn the slit disk back into the unit disk by a conformal mapping. Okay, so let's go to breakout rooms for five, six minutes, and then we'll come back and discuss uh, the results. Okay.
Okay, welcome back. So, um, so raise your virtual hand if you're a reporter for your breakout room. That means go to reactions and find where it says raise hand. Okay, uh, Alex, can you tell us your thoughts? Um, yeah, so, okay, so the first map that, that we were thinking of doing is going from uh, slit disk to uh, upper half disk via square root. Ah, nice, okay. So you, you take the disk and you somehow open it at the slit and take this angle of two pi here and half it so that it goes to just this region in the upper half disk. Yeah. Okay. And then the second map, uh, if I'm faithfully reporting what uh, my team uh, talked about is uh, then to send that w via Z plus one over Z. Okay. Wow, what does the image of that look like? Um, so I might be mistaken, but I thought that that was going to be to the disk, but. Well, let's think about what it does. So um, on the upper edge here, uh, actually let's write this as a map uh, with a common denominator. So it's Z squared plus one uh, divided by Z, right? So, um, yeah. okay, so let's see. So uh, it sends the origin to infinity. So it's yeah, probably yeah. not quite going to the unit disk because the origin is on the boundary of your region now. Yeah, yeah, sorry, that, my, my mistake. I think that it's supposed to go to the lower half plane. To the lower half plane, okay. So let's let's uh, check that. So. Um, uh, maybe you can explain why it should go to the lower half plane. Okay, so I agree that this point goes to infinity. Right. Um, How about these two points, plus or minus one? Um, those go to uh, plus and minus two, I think. Okay, right. So this this one squared. So those go to plus or minus two. Okay. So that goes to plus or minus two. And then this arc also goes to plus or minus two, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because that's like uh, cosine in there. Okay. So, so these two arcs both go to this arc. Oh, uh, sorry, this arc goes to here. Oh, I see, and then this arc goes to th these two arcs. Is that right? Because this point goes to infinity. Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so A goes here, and then we have B and C, and those go to B and C. Yes. Okay, good. And so that appears to go to the lower half point. I agree. Right, and then, and then we can go from there to the disk. That one's, that one's easier. <laughs> okay. uh, great. Um, thank you. Uh, so uh, Catherine, do you want to add any comments? Do you have any different discussion in your group? Um, we did the first, the same first step, yeah. uh, but then we sent the, and now I'm not. Then we sent the like half disk to the to a quarter plane. Mm -hmm. And how did you do that? Uh, now I'm a little bit confused. Well, if I don't know say the formula. Did you use uh, a Mobius transformation? Uh, well, the idea was just to send was to send one endpoint to infinity and then another to to zero or something. Yeah, right. So there is a Mobius transformation that sends this point to zero and this point to infinity. And then what happens to these two arcs? So one of them should go to like the imaginary axis, I guess. Okay. Uh, and the other two, the real axis. Right. 
right? So one thing you know for sure is that these two circular arcs, since they now go through infinity, they go to straight lines. Mm -hmm. And they don't go to straight lines emanating from wherever this point goes, so that's zero. And if it didn't end up being in this quadrant, it would certainly be in a region bounded by two lines meeting in a 90 degree angle. And so you could always rotate it so it's in this quadrant. Okay, and then? Um, and then you square it to get back to the upper half plane. Okay. And then you send that to the disk. Okay, great. Um, let's see, who else? Alec, do you have any comments to offer? Oh yeah, we used the same map as the first group, but also like it's also this is this problem is also a special case of the homework because you just plug in like the homework was to find a conformal mapping from a pie slice, and this is just the whole pie. Excellent. So the homework was good for something. Uh, good comment. Anything else you want to remark? Uh, nope. Okay. So one thing I want to remark is this: you might ask. Um, Okay, so the Riemann mapping doesn't always extend to a map from the boundary of U of, the, of, of delta to the boundary of U. Maybe it extends, though, the other way. Maybe there's a continuous extension going this way. Actually, that's not true in this case. There is no continuous extension of the Riemann map that goes from here to the unit disk. Why not? Actually, maybe Vinka, I see you are also a reporter. Do you want yeah. to address that question? Yeah, sure. Um, it's it's because the um, both sides of the uh, that that little interval that you cut out, like the north side and the south side, right. get sent to different portions of the boundary. Absolutely. So already this map going from here to here takes this interval, and if you approach from this side you go to B, but if you approach from the other side, you go to C. So in general, Riemann mappings can take slits that go into your domain and tear them open. And therefore, this mapping doesn't have a uh, continuous extension. Any other comments from your group, Finka? Oh, uh, so we came up with the second group's um, uh, sequence of transformations. OK, great. Uh, excellent. OK, so that shows. Uh, a lot of facility now with, uh, with constructing explicit Riemann maps. OK, uh, so let's go on. And I want to finish today by saying a few words about the general theory of Riemann maps. What assertions we can make about all Riemann mappings, aside from their boundary behavior. And uh, to study this, um, it's traditional to introduce two models for the space of all Riemann mappings. Now, if you remember that any simply connected domain in the plane gives you a Riemann mapping, we're really giving analytic models for the set of all simply connected domains in the plane, which is quite remarkable. The only distinction is that in these models, we mildly normalize the Riemann mapping. Remember, the Riemann mapping is slightly ambiguous, and you can compose with Mobius transformations in the domain and range. So there's two standard normalizations for Riemann mappings. The first is the class S, which consists of Riemann mappings on the unit disk, normalized so they send 0 to 0, and so that the first derivative at 0 is equal to 1. Of course, if you had a general Riemann mapping and it went to U with a point P, you could first translate so the point P is the origin, and then you could scale so the derivative becomes one. So up to small modifications by affine transformations, this is the space of all Riemann mappings. And these Riemann mappings being convergent on the disk can be written as power series beginning with Z, Z plus A2 plus A3 Z cubed and so on. And thus, a domain in the plane is specified by an infinite sequence of complex numbers. Quite tricky is to characterize the sequences of complex numbers that lie in this space. Those are the functions f with the property that on the unit disk they are one to one. So that's a very subtle condition. Um, and we deal with it by just giving them a name. 
So this class of mappings is called S. S is the German word schlicht, which is meant to uh, connote well, univalent or one-to-one. -one. The second type of mapping, which is, which is uh, just a different normalization and is also very useful and intuitive, this is the type that's close, more closely related to Julia sets, is you consider the Riemann map defined on the outside of the unit disk, what I call one over delta. One over delta is the set of Z, such that either Z is equal to infinity or the absolute value of Z is bigger than one. It's a subset of the Riemann sphere, so to speak. The northern hemisphere, whereas the unit disk is the southern hemisphere. And here the natural base point is infinity rather than zero. And so we these maps send the complex plane, so the, the outside of the unit disk, to the outside of a compact set in the complex plane. The image is this domain U, and they send infinity to infinity. So if you like, they send the, the, the outside of the unit disk. I mean, since they send infinity to infinity, you could also just say that F sends C minus the closed unit disk to C minus a compact set. The point at infinity is not so important. Now, mappings defined in the inside of the disk have power series expansions. Mappings defined near infinity have Laurent series expansions. They have expansions in, in powers of one over Z. Also, since the map is injective, only one point goes to infinity. That means it only has one pole of multiplicity one. So these mappings have power series that look like this. They start with the Z. And then they have multiples of the negative powers of Z. Now, in principle, there could be a constant term here, Z plus a constant plus B1. Or there could be a B0 here. But we normalize so that B0 equals 0. And you see, you know, whatever the image was here, we can translate it to make this constant term go away. That just replaces F by F minus B0. So the normalized mappings in sigma begin with B1 over Z, B2 over Z squared, and so on. OK, so there's two beautiful theorems about the coefficients of these mappings uh, that I will have to defer till next time for the proof of, but which I can state and state some of the consequences. So the first theorem which we will prove is that for all F and S, the, uh, actually, let me first state, state a conceptual theorem. The first theorem is that S and sigma are compact. What that means is that any sequence of mappings in either of these spaces has a subsequence that converges uniformly on compact sets, and the limit is still in these spaces. So the space of Riemann mappings is compact. And what that means is any invariant of these mappings that depends continuously on F has to assume its maximum. And then you can ask what its maximum is. So some of the invariants you might look at are, for example, these coefficients here. But there's many, many other invariants you might look at. And there's a whole industry of figuring out what are the optimal bounds for Riemann mappings. But in many applications, all you need to know is that there are some bounds. And the existence of some bounds follows from the fact that S and sigma are compact. OK, so as a corollary, one knows that the ANs are all less than or are each less than or equal to some constant that depends just on N for all F and S. And actually, we are going to prove a theorem. The first interesting case is the coefficient A2. We're going to prove A2 is a less than or equal to 2. And as many of you know, there is a, a bigger theorem, which was open for a long time. It's called the Bieberbach conjecture, which says that An is less than or equal to N. This was proved by de Branche in the 1980s, and there's now some fairly short uh, and economical proofs available. Uh, however, this theorem, I have to say, it doesn't have a lot of immediate applications. 
it was kind of a challenge to complex analysts to solve such a simply stated theorem. There's no corresponding theorem known, by the way, for the class sigma. Nobody knows what the best bounds are on these BNs, but we do know another theorem called the area theorem, which says that the sum of N times the absolute value of BN squared from one to infinity is less than or equal to one. And so in particular, we get that um, the absolute value of Bn squared it's, itself is less than or equal to one over n for each n and for all f and, and c. Okay, and these, these somewhat um, arcane sounding theorems about coefficients turn out to have very geometric consequences. And one of the consequences, which I'm going to emphasize, which is very beautiful, is that since the for each Riemann mapping from the unit disk into the plane, normalized as here, there's some distance from zero to the boundary of the image. And that distance is actually a continuous function on this space. So it must have an upper bound and it must have a lower bound. And it turns out that the distance from zero to the boundary of u is always between one and a quarter. And this rather geometric theorem will lead to a very nice statement about what the hyperbolic metric to the Poincare metric looks like on an arbitrary simply connected region. So I'll conclude our discussion of the Riemann mapping theorem next time by proving these theorems and saying what they have to do with the hyperbolic metric and then saying a little bit about the triply punctured sphere. Um, so to keep up with the reading, uh, the course notes are pretty well fleshed out now. There's references to Nahari for more details on this, also to my notes on advanced complex analysis. And then I encourage you to start looking at this, the uh, chapter on harmonic functions in the course notes, because that's what we'll be uh, starting on next. Okay. And as usual, I'll, I'll hang out uh, after turning off the recording.